On a personal note, um, uh, the Sloan Foundation has been uh, in my blood and in my family and in my life for the last 15 years. They were the principal uh, financial supporters and uh, intellectual supporters uh, for my work in online learning uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, when I first met Frank Myatis, uh, who ran the Anytime Anywhere program at Sloan. Uh, Frank immediately, uh, when I met him at a uh, workshop, uh, asked me to join him uh, for lunch. I had never met him before. And uh, over lunch, when he found out that I was uh, involved in a cybersecurity pro uh, sorry, in an online program uh, in um, telecommunications management, he uh, su suggested that he give me some money to jumpstart it. And uh, at that time, I was working at um, Stevens Institute of Technology. And uh, I, I was uh, green then uh, in uh, the academic world. And I had no idea uh, about grants or anything. Uh, I had come from industry, uh, publishing industry. And uh, I uh, ran with this uh, uh, supposed, and was, grant in my hand to my boss, uh, who was the dean. Uh, and I said, uh, I just got a grant o over lunch. And in, in total disbelief, he said, nobody gets a grant over lunch. It takes years. So, uh, but uh, Frank Myotis was uh, very innovative. And as you know now, there are over 5 million students online. And Frank, <coughs> my friend and colleague at the Sloan Foundation, uh, was the driving force uh, for online learning in a particular way uh, at the Sloan Foundation. Uh, the best way uh, to get things uh, underway uh, in earnest is for you to open up your bag and look inside there, and you will see a, uh, the program for the, today's events. And I suggest that you turn uh, to page five, uh, and you'll come to the first page of what is a tour de force of uh, critical cybersecurity programs at uh, NYU Poly. I think perhaps uh, they're the most comprehensive of any at any university. Uh, starting from high school competitions on page 11, uh, the noted uh, seesaw competitions for high school students, going all the way to PhD scholarships financed by uh, the NSF uh, on the facing page on page 10. Uh, Poly cybersecurity initiatives cover numerous graduate and undergraduate programs, online master's degrees, which just won uh, the uh, national award from Sloan C for the best online program and uh, many other uh, activities, including a new cybersecurity management track. Uh, critically, uh, there are four very highly and innovative uh, uh, special purpose labs as well. When I first came to Poly, uh, I had heard about the positive things accomplished by NASA, N-A-S-A. -A. Uh, uh, but I was mystified since uh, I wasn't sure uh, that Polly had a space program. Uh, but soon I learned that there was an extraordinary productive uh, faculty member by the name of Nasser, uh, who's sitting right here. Only later did I discover that NASA and Nasser were exactly the same people. And uh, so uh, uh, you, today, uh, you, as you go through that program and uh, you learn more about what we do here, these remarkable achievements uh, of Poly's cybersecurity program fall under uh, the indefatigable leadership of uh, my new friend, Nasser Memon. Nasser, please. <laughs> Nasser, before, before you uh, uh, say your few words, I'd like to say a few words about Nasser himself. He is the chair of today's events and the professor of computer science and engineering at Poly. He is also the director of Poly's noted ISIS lab and a founding member of CRISP, a collaborative NYU schools, Poly, Steinhardt, Wagner, Stern, and Courant. I think you'll see the names of those uh, uh, members of the CRISP program on the back of your program. NASA's rich lines of research are in digital forensics, data compression, multimedia computing, and security. He's the author of more than 250 scientific papers and holds a dozen pat patents in image compression and security. He has won several notable awards, including the NSF Career Award and Polly's Award for Excellence in Education. 
NASA has served on a number of scholarly journal editorial boards and was the editor-in-chief of Transactions of Information Security and Forensics. He is an IEEE fellow and a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Signal Processing Society. With time on his hands, he also went into business, founding two early stage startups, Digital Assembly and Vivid. Friends, colleagues, and guests, NASA men. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, I don't want to say too many words and stand in between you and our distinguished panelists and our speaker. Uh, but one comment I would like to make is that uh, our security program has a number of faculty members uh, who uh, work much harder than I do uh, and who have, who have been, played a critical role in making it successful. As I say, I'm, I'm just a pretty face. Uh, there are lots of other uh, faculty members and, and students. Most importantly, uh, as you know, in any university program, uh, the students are what really make us successful. I, I don't know if you know this uh, joke that goes around in, academ uh, in academia about the importance of advisors. So the joke goes as follows. So uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you have a, a rabbit sitting outside a cave uh, typing away uh, sort of uh, feverishly at, at something and uh, a fox goes by and, and asks the rag rabbit what are you what are you doing what are you what are you typing and the rabbit says I'm typing my thesis and fox says that's interesting what's the title of your thesis and the rabbit says well the title of my thesis is how to eat a fox and the fox says that's kind of silly I mean uh, you're a little rabbit what do you know about eating foxes the rabbit says well come on into the cave, I'll show you. And the rabbit and fox enter the cave and uh, a few minutes later the rabbit comes out, no fox, and, uh, and then you can go on and you can say this with a wolf and a, and a tiger or whatever, something, you can repeat this depending on how many drinks you've had. <laughs> but, 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 but at the end of the day the rabbit goes back into the cave and there is a lion sitting inside licking its chops and there are lots of bones sitting around. And the moral of the story is that it doesn't matter what your thesis is, it matters who your advisor is. <laughs> so, so that's fine, but I, I think I have another joke which I think is more pertinent. This time there is a lion sitting around on, on a rock and uh, a, sort of a wolf goes by uh, and the wolf is crying. And, uh, the lion says, what happened? And the wolf says, well, I wanted to listen to the NBA Finals Game 6 is going on, and I, I couldn't listen to the commentary. I, I guess the good old nobody listens to commentary anymore, but uh, I can't watch it, whatever, and my, my radio doesn't work. The lion says, give it to me, I'll fix it. And the wolf says, you're a big, like, hulky, massive guy with clumsy paws. What do you know about fixing something small and delicate like a radio? The lion says, don't worry about it, just, just uh, give it to me, uh, I'll fix it. And he goes inside the cave, comes back five minutes later, it's all fixed. And the wolf is happy and goes on its, his way. And again, you can repeat it with a cassette player or a iPad or whatever with other animals. But uh, at the end, of the end of the day, the lion walks in into the cave and there are lots of little rabbits sitting out there like fixing little things with their hands. <laughs> And the moral of the story is if you, know what, if, you, if you want to know why a professor is famous, just look at his students. Yeah. <laughs> then you'll know why. So, so as I said, it's, it's the faculty members and, and uh, so there are many here, Justin Kapos, Ramesh Curry, Phyllis Fankel, Keith Ross, uh, Jonathan Chow, uh, who work in cybersecurity and the, literally the hundreds of students involved in, all in the program who make it successful. So thank you for being here. Uh, let me now introduce our uh, speaker today, our, our guest of honor, uh, Ms. Uh, Marcus Sachs. Uh, Mark is the Vice President of Government Affairs for National Security Policy at Verizon. Uh, Verizon is, as you know, is the largest provider in, in the United States and a global company that operates in 140 countries. 
So that, that puts Mark's role, puts him in charge of uh, Verizon's emergency preparedness. It also charges him with assisting federal, state, and local officials on their national security preparedness and cybersecurity policy coordination. Uh, since 2011, Mark also has been the vice chair of the U.S. Communication Center's Coordinating Council, the industry group uh, that works with government to protect the security of all our digital communications. Uh, for many years, and I've followed Mark for many years, and he has been one of the outspoken sort of evangelists on cybersecurity uh, that we have. He has warned us repeatedly that the government alone cannot keep the cyber world safe, that it needs help from businesses in particular. Uh, he came to this conclusion after a long career in the government service. He spent two decades in the U.S. Army. Uh, Mark was one of the initial members of a small military unit that organized cyberspace operations in reaction to foreign threats against sensitive military networks. Later, he served in the White House and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, President George Bush appointed him to the National Security Council and to develop the national strategy to secure cyberspace. Uh, President Obama seeks his advice as a member of the Commission on Cybersecurity and he's also a former director of the SANS Internet Storm Center. I, I can't think of anyone better to launch this NYU Poly Sloan Foundation lecture series on cybersecurity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Mark Sachs. Quick technical pause here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, there are a number of ways of uh, communicating with us about questions you may have uh, to Mark or to the panelists who will be here uh, subsequently. So uh, you can uh, uh, email your questions or uh, tweet your questions as it says up there. And uh, you can also um, uh, connect to Wi-Fi uh, at uh, Poly, uh, Poly's Wi-Fi uh, activities here. Uh, and uh, plug into the Sloan conference, and you can uh, participate that way too. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. And if we can switch that over, and is my microphone live? Guys in the back, good to go? Everybody can hear me? Excellent. So we're just waiting on a slide switch, and I'll just go ahead and start running my mouth. Bob, thank you very much. Nasser, where'd you get off to? There you are. Thanks very much for the kind introduction and to uh, NYU Poly and to all of you for being here today. We're um, sitting at a kind of a transition point in terms of cyber and cyberspace and cyberspace security and, and what do we do with this thing? What do we do with this beast that we've created that's transformed our lives in ways that none of us could have imagined? Even if you've been in cyber your whole life or your whole career, you can't imagine where we've come. And of course, looking forward, where will we be 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? Where will this take us? So over the next hour, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the realities of what we're seeing and what got us to where we are today, some of the threats. Let me just go ahead and flip over to my little outline here. Uh, just a, a kind of a quick overview of what got us to where we are, and I'm going to focus on three major areas. The, the threats that we face in cyberspace, the thinking of cyberspace as a large technical system that we're trying to manage, and I'll explain what that is when I get to that point. And then also, how do we manage this chaos? How do we bring ourselves together? How, do, how can we build partnerships, this holy grail of information sharing? And of course, at the end, I'm going to wrap up with you know, some things that you can do. In your packages, you should have received a copy of the breach report, the data breach investigations report. Uh, let me just grab my copy down here just to... I'm not going to brief this to you, but it is in your packet, so please take time to, to take a look at this later. And I will mention it again uh, in a few minutes on the, uh, go ahead and take the picture. There we go. Okay. <laughs> now you got it. That's good. All right. So we do have to have these little photographic timeouts from time to time. And uh, for those who are watching online, I do appreciate, I know there are millions of people around the world who have stopped everything they're doing. Uh, production has ceased. Buses have stopped. Airplanes have landed. And people are tuned in to watch to see how we get past all these problems. So for those who are online, sit back, relax, get yourself a latte. But before we get started, let's have just a quick little discussion about risk. Everybody, I'm sure, whether you're in business, public sector, private sector, academia, private citizens, and others, you've probably seen charts like this before. Well, we want to build a risk analysis of some sort. I'm just going to say 
low to high for cost, zero to 100% for risk, just arbitrary values. What does a normal risk curve look like? Is it a straight line? Is it a curve line? Does it go from bottom left to upper right? How does it normally play out? I ask this because I'm in an academic environment, so as a lecturer I can ask the students. Shall I pick somebody? What does it look like? What does a curve normally look like? What does it look like? Asymptotic. Asymptotic, certainly. So it starts high, but never hits zero. There's always something down here. There's always some risk. It doesn't matter how much money you put at the problem. There's always going to be some risk. You cannot make it go away. And it's this kind of this area down here. Does everybody understand that intuitively? So when I get to the end of this lecture, I'm not going to put this slide back up again, but I want you to think about this because we can never make cyber risk go away. There will always be something there. What we can do about it is this area here. That's avoidable risk at some cost. Now, you can avoid a significant amount. You know, if you want to play with some integrals and derivatives and things, you can play around up here and calculate how much risk you can avoid. But you must also understand that there is a necessary amount of unavoidable risk. And trying to chase risk to zero will not work. And many organizations get caught up in that trap. They think that the more money, the more resources, the more people that you can push at it, I can make this thing go to zero, and you can't. It won't happen. Why can't you get down here? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. Why does that exist? Why is it that that doesn't happen? So let's go back in time a little bit and talk just briefly about the Internet, just so we're all on the same sheet of music here. Oftentimes, cyberspace and Internet are equated as the same, but they're not. I think we all understand that, right? The Internet is actually a subset of cyberspace. There's a lot more to this world out there besides the Internet. But for sake of today's discussion, let's just limit it to the Internet because that's what we all are interacting with and that's where we have all the problems. One general that I worked for many years ago called this the world's greatest get-along. In other words, there are no rules. There's no president, there's no king, there's no queen, there's no potentate, there's no organization that actually runs the Internet like you would say running a railroad or running a business or running a government. We really are just getting along. Tens of thousands of autonomous systems that are all interconnected that loosely follow some rules that a bunch of people came up with that we call uh, requests for comments or RFCs. And as long as you're sort of compliant with this loose set of technical rules, you can play. That's pretty clever if you think about it because of the resiliency there. Because it's loosely coupled, this thing survives very, very well. Of course, it upsets people who like to have strong, rigid control because that means things can change in there and things can get out of control. Well. The original thinking back in the 60s and 70s was that the ARPANET and the NSFNet and other earlier prototypes were just experiments. We'd run out of money after a while, we'd publish papers, we'd go on and do other research, and, and this thing called the ARPANET and whatnot, it'll just fade away. Nobody imagined that the protocols and the principles and the things that were worked on back in the 70s and 80s would actually be embedded in the systems we have today. Well, if you think about, for those of you who have done network research, TCP IP, for example, one of the basic fundamental protocol suites, SMTP for email, FTP, Telnet, all those old protocols written in a time when the people on the ends, the users, were researchers, academics, military officials, government officials. They all knew each other. They all trusted each other. What they couldn't trust was the network in the middle, largely the telephone companies, where I come from. So the protocols were designed to not trust the networks but trust the edge. You have to have a trust point someplace. So we knew that was a problem, but it's academic. This will all go away. Well, now, 40 years later, it turns out those protocols are embedded. The edge today, the users, you and me, is there a lot of trust there? Now, the trust really is in the network now. We've built very powerful networks, very resilient networks, but yet the soul of the Internet still believes that there's trust on the edges. You exploit that trust, and you have a field day. And that, if you go back to that earlier slide, that's the first reason why you will never get risk down to zero. There are built-in vulnerabilities, built-in security problems, things that we just can't take out. They're like part of the DNA now of the Internet. That's kind of scary. It's a little bit relieving because then it says, wow, that's why this is so hard. That's why I can never get down to zero. Well, about 20 years or so ago, this, this cool thing called uh, hypertext and World Wide Web and whatnot all came, came to life in the early 90s 
Web browsers came of age, Netscape, uh, Internet Explorer after a while, start off with Mosaic for those of you who have you know, kind of been around this game since the beginning. We had no idea where it was going to take us. By the end of the 90s, the word web surfing, the web internet, uh, those words were all over the place. Um, a series of tubes was the word we used to hear in Washington from an infamous uh, speech. But as things exploded, and we're not even quite at the 20 year point, look at how far we've come. When statistics were first taken, it was in 1993, we started counting things to see what was this internet bringing to us. And we're only talking tens of thousands of websites, a million pages, three million users. Look at where we are today, and it hasn't even been quite two decades yet since we've started counting things. Look at the explosion. One third of humanity is on the internet. One third in less than 20 years. What government would be bothered by that if all your people all of a sudden can talk to everybody else? You know, here in the United States, we take this for granted. This is the way things are supposed to be. Other countries don't like that. That's too rapid. That's too fast. All of this is happening over an infrastructure that nobody's in charge of. Nobody runs it. It's just a big get along. And it's inherently insecure but yet we trust it as though it's some magical thing that just has always been there and it just kind of works. All of us are connected right now, right? Some of you have your, your iPhones, your iPads, Androids. But we're, we're, we, we couldn't live without this stuff. But yet here we are and this is what we face. So in all this good stuff that's been going on, all this greatness, this garden of good, there of course is evil that's out there. So again, just kind of looking quickly over our shoulders of just breaking the world up into decades. Back in the 70s, when networks were really just being thought about, nobody needed to attack the ARPANET because it failed all by itself. I mean, it would just, it run for a few hours and it would die. So there was no need to really think of any reason to attack it. Although there was some academic thinking that got started in the 80s, papers being written, you know, how could I do attacks? How could I launch stuff? And by the end of the 80s, we're actually beginning to see some of this. The old Morris worm that you might remember and the brain virus and other things were, were coming of age back then. The 1990s, though, is when this really took off. When, when society figured out that the internet was there, that this was something new, the dot-com explosion. So along with all that technology came lots and lots of new threats, new attacks, and a, and a world of the, the hacker clubs, what we like to call the script kitty hackers, the little teenage kids that would just run scripts just for their jollies. In the past decade, though, that sort of changed. And all this noise that we were seeing back in the 90s it appeared to go silent for a while, and we were wondering what had happened, and it turned out, in the end, it had all moved over to the criminal world. And in order to steal from all that value online, you have to do it quietly. You don't want to make a big deal about it. So a lot of what we saw in the past decade was oriented on financial gain, theft of information, espionage, things along that, in that world. So now you have to ask, well, where are we going in this decade? SCADA systems. Everybody know what that is, what I'm talking about here? Industrial control? So we're talking about switching systems, uh, pumps, motors, valves, power grids, chemical plants, air traffic control. That's a new target now. Is that scary? Of course it is. That's far worse than somebody stealing your credit card. If somebody can actually control an airplane in flight from the ground, that's very scary stuff. We're also seeing uh, supply chain problems. And we'll talk about supply chain here in just a moment to show you some real world examples of, of the problems that we're facing if I go in and I start hacking the hardware versus hacking the software or trying to fool you as a user. And just this past year, we saw with the, the rise of Anonymous and some of these other neat little groups out there, hacktivism, almost a throwback to the 1990s, very in-your-face, public, make a big deal about breaking into your website and publishing information. So where are we going to be when I get to 2020 and look back on this past decade? Who knows if I'm right or not. But the bottom line today, the big takeaway here, today's Internet, technically built on protocols, principles, beliefs, threats that existed 30 to 40 years ago, but yet we face a whole new world. This is now a business. The Internet is not academic. It's not an experiment. It's our life. It's our values. It's our relationships. Everything we do is inside of this new thing called the Internet, but yet it runs as an experiment, and of course it's just like the real world. It's very attractive to very, very bad people. So let me transition a little bit and talk about who these bad actors are, the reality of what's out there. All of you read the hype, you read the newspaper articles, you see people talk about the evils in cyberspace. I'm going to try and boil this down to just a couple or three types of actors that you need to worry about as individuals and potentially in your role in business, your role in government, 
your role in academia, but primarily your role as individuals. How do you protect yourself from this? So lots and lots of website attacks are happening. You're seeing phishing. You're seeing website defacement, things like that. That's fine. That, that all goes on. Well, let's get into the bad stuff. A number of years ago, the Defense Department did a study to try and figure out what does evil in cyberspace look like. And what they came up with was a basic set of threat actor groups, as we like to call it, ranging from state-sponsored, this would be nation states, of which the United States could fairly put themselves up there as well. In fact, when we first got into this game back in, you know, actually thinking about it a few decades ago, there was only two or three or four countries that could possibly fall into this category. Now virtually every country could be there. Everybody's developing capabilities now in cyberspace, offense, defense in that world. Ranging down, of course, through terrorists, spies, criminals, hackers at the bottom. Maybe there's some insiders thrown in for good measure and a few other little groups. But the Defense Department's analysis of this was not bad. The, the big takeaway, the, the insight that came from this, is if you build another one of these kind of charts here and you say the, the potential damage that any of these groups can do. If you think about a hacker, an individual hacker probably has low potential for doing any damage, just, just one hacker by themselves. But one nation, potentially high. Does that make sense? Just kind of on that range and that's kind of this up and down. Same thing with probability of currents. There's not that many nations. We're talking 200-ish or so. But there's millions of hackers. So the probability of occurrence goes real high off to this end. Now here's the insight. If you plot them on a line of occurrence versus damage, it makes this normal little curve. But as they study that, these curves move outward over the years. So a hacker today, a couple of years from now, might be on par with what a spy can do. Give it two more years, they might be able to do what today's terrorists can do. That's an interesting insight. In terms of what these groups are doing as they're getting better over the years, now you have to ask yourself, can a similar chart be made on the defensive side? You know, what do we have a lot of that each individual, the probability of them doing good is low, but there's lots and lots of them? That'd be people like you and me, users, people that are connected to your networks. Who would sit up here? There's probably a very small number of people who really get it. There's not that many of them, but their individual efforts can have a big impact. But does their curve move out at the same rate as those in the attack community? And that's the chilling thing, of course not. The good guys' curves are moving much, much slower than the bad guys' curves. Again, part of that piece at the bottom of my original chart, the risk you cannot get away from that will always be there is because of this type of, of phenomena, this observ observation of ours. So let's walk through a couple of these actors. Just, just name a few names up at the top when, we, when we're looking at nation states that are problems. Everybody's heard of Stuxnet, right? It's been in the news recently. Uh, New York Times a couple of weeks ago says this is the United States and Israel uh, based on lots of leaked documents. There's a book out that claims all this. The U.S. government has not, uh, probably will never officially say, yes, that was us. They're not, they're not going to do that. However, I did see last week uh, some Israeli media is uh, trying to say, no, no, actually it was the Israelis. We want to make sure that you know, they're not seen as second fiddle, that, that really, it really was us, that, that the United States learned from us. We're the, we're the guys that really wrote you know, Stuxnet. So I'm sure we'll see more of that posturing as we go by. What was this all about? Little piece of code not delivered over a network, delivered via USB keys to try and destroy the centrifuges that make uh, weapons grade uranium rather than bombing a nuclear facility. Let's go in and do a cyber attack. Very interesting idea. Something that had been theoretical for lots and lots of years now being carried out. Well, this has been done. It's been proven that it can be done. Does this set ourselves up where other countries now may want to invest in this technology and use it against us, or allies, or our friends? Interesting possibilities that are there. If I look over at China, another country we're very interested in, we're wonderful trading partners, lots of neat trade going back and forth between China and the rest of the world, but we also see a lot of espionage coming from that country, which is unfortunate. And we start digging into it and come to find out that a large amount of what appears to us to be espionage is really just research. It's academic research. It's students that are curious. They're connected to the networks. They want to go see what's out there. A computer can't tell what's going on. They don't know if it's a real spy sitting on the other end or if it's a student sitting on the other end or if it's, it's a professor versus an engineer or, or, or even a military person. All we can tell is where it's coming from and what their actions are. But one of the things that's very unnerving in this world of, of uh, manufacturing and outsourcing and so forth is this rise of counterfeit technology. This is a problem. 
This is a problem for China. It's something China's going to have to come to grips with. There's an estimate now that roughly 10% of the global electronic supply system is fake. I'm going to show you some examples of what I'm talking about. The FBI did an investigation a few years ago into several types of uh, switches, routers, interface cards, and found that many Cisco products, things that you think are legitimate Cisco, are in fact counterfeits made by factories that do produce legitimate Cisco products, but they're also producing fake Cisco products. And this is not a bad reflection on Cisco. It's a bad reflection on the supply chain and, and how much trust we've put into just buying something. For example, here are two interface cards that would go into a Cisco device. This is a counterfeit card. This is a real card. If I hadn't told you which was which, and you didn't have all the little circles and things on there, could you tell the difference between the two? Particularly if you're an ordering person, somebody comes to you in your organization and you're the one who does all the ordering and says, I need one of these devices, or actually I need five of them, go out and buy them. Uh, if you're motivated and you're rewarded by how much money you can save your organization, are you going to pay $1,000 for the one on the right? Or are you going to pay 100 bucks for the one on the left? Right? You don't know the difference. You don't even know that the one on the left is counterfeit. All you see is price differences. And let me show you what I'm talking about with price differences. This is a site called usedcisco.com. Here's that very same card. List price $1,000. Today it's on sale for $99.99. This is a real screen grab. I didn't make this stuff up. This, you can go find this online today. Why is it $100? 90% off. Do you think somebody who paid $1,000 for a real card is going to put it up for sale on a used site for $100? I mean, cognitively, does that make sense? I can't prove this is fake, but our little meters ought to be going off. Something's not right there. Well, let's say I don't want to pay $100. I start looking around online. I go over to Amazon, and uh, it used to cost $1,000. Now I can get them used for $29. Uh, <laughs> Here's the new ones, or the kind of the refurbished ones, but 29 bucks used, really? If it cost $1,000 when somebody bought it, and they're selling it for $29, is that real? Let's keep looking. I go over to eBay. I get it for 99 cents. <laughs> the same product on eBay for 99 cents that lists for $1,000 if I buy it straight from Cisco. Cognitive Making sense? You see where I'm going here? And it's not just Cisco. If I want a new iPhone, why should I pay full price to Apple or to Verizon or AT&T or anybody else? Let me just go to this website where it says, buy a new copy iPhone 3G. They're telling me it's fake. They're advertising that it's a counterfeit. And the prices are pretty cheap too. I forget where, yeah, uh, price, US dollars, 93 bucks a piece, minimum order of five. In your face, counterfeiting. Oh, and by the way, if you want to make sure that it's authentic, you can also get a fake certificate of authenticity, <laughs> signed and stamped by the officials that says this really is an iPhone. It's rampant. It's out of control. The military has done some investigations into this, and we've even found that military hardware is counterfeit, military software is counterfeit. It's scary stuff, folks that we're now seeing this poisoning on the hardware side, not just attacks at websites and phishing and email and things like that, but fake stuff like this. And it affects you as customers also, as consumers. When you're buying things online, are you buying the real thing or are you buying a fake? We don't know. Oftentimes, the fakes, by the way, work just as good as the real stuff. In fact, if you're a golfer, there are fake ping, P-I-N-G, golf clubs that actually perform better than real ping golf clubs. If you hook them up to one of these testing machines, they'll actually drive the ball further. The fake ones do. So you're kind of like, you know, the counterfeiters are really into this game. They're actually doing product improvement in order to sell the counterfeits. It also, we find legitimate sites like Newegg. Many of you have probably heard of Newegg, an online place where you can buy products. Uh, didn't realize it at the time, but they were selling uh, Intel Core i7s, fake ones. How do you know they're fake? Well, if, first off, they don't work when you install them. The thing doesn't work. But if you flip it over, you've got stuff like, Look at this misspelling. That should be socket, S-O-C-K-E-T. See how it's S-O-C-H-E-T? And then other things like, you may not be able to read this in the back, but it says, this box contains an Intel processor, ANS, A-N-S, a thermal solution designed for use 
in a, I-N with no space, in a desktop PC, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, hey, counterfeiters, you're, you're giving me all this, this cool electronics. Can you at least do a spell checker before you print the little labels, you know, and stick this stuff? I mean, come on, get in the game a little bit more before you start flooding the market with all this fake stuff. Well, the criminal community, another group you need to be very worried about, besides just those who do espionage and counterfeiting and so forth, has discovered, or maybe rediscovered, that the Internet is the place to go. It kind of goes back to this old joke of you ask the bank robber, why do you rob the bank? What's the classic answer? Because that's where the money is, right. You go to the bank because that's the money. Why do you rob people blind online? That's where the money is. There's so much value in cyberspace, so much stuff that's out there. Anonymity rules on the Internet. We love our anonymous behavior, right? We like to go online. It's like that old New Yorker cartoon about the dog doesn't know that the, the Internet doesn't know you're a dog when you're online, that kind of stuff. The criminals love that. Could you imagine walking into a bank, totally invisible, totally cloaked? You walk by Officer Friendly, Officer Friendly doesn't even see you. You walk up to the teller who can't even see you. You rob the teller and take money that they don't even know that they had, and you walk out the door and they have no clue that you were even there. What a perfect crime that would be. And that's exactly what we can do online today. So it has, has opened up a rich market for crime. We are all targets of this. It doesn't matter where you are in the social scale. It doesn't matter what your job is or what you do. As individuals, you are being targeted daily in your online behavior by criminal groups. So what's it all worth? Well, now, let me ask you a question again, academic thinking here. Remember your basic economics classes of supply and demand? Remember that? You have two curves that intersect each other where the supply curve and the demand curve come. That equilibrium point there drives price versus how much of it's available versus how much demand there is. If that price is and predictable, it turns out the answer is, of course not. These things can go chaotic on me. They can do unpredictable things. And in fact, the Internet falls into that category in spades. So does stuff like stock markets. Think of financial systems, the flash crash that happened, what, two years ago or so? Completely out of nowhere, boom, down it goes, bam, it comes right back up again. We see these all the time. So where this takes us is an interesting question. As an organization, a government, a nation, a planet, is there a way to govern this stuff? Is there a way to control chaos? The answer is, yeah, but we've got to rethink how we're organized. We have to organize ourselves more chaotically in order to do that. In fact, many are saying instead of just being large technical systems, we're now large chaotic systems. And if we kind of adopt that mentality, that might help explain why organizations that are linear, rational, hierarchical are having a very hard time dealing with the management of something that isn't linear, rational, hierarchical, predictable. It is totally chaotic. Now you look at the new companies, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the LinkedIn's, the Googles, etc. Look at how they're organized. Very flat. Yes, there is some loose organization at the top. There is a CEO and some other things like that. Beyond that, it's fairly flat. Groups just come together, ad hoc groups, they form, they produce things, they go away. Another group emerges, forms, does things, goes away. Those organizations are thriving. They're doing well. They have embraced this idea here, this, this chaotic kind of world, and they're doing very, very well. Older organizations, particularly governmental organizations that are just hanging on like a thread to highly organized structure are failing. They can't come to grips with these new technologies. They don't understand what to do with them. So we've got to rethink how we organize ourselves. All this complexity, if you study chaos theory, complex complexity theory, you know there's a thing called emergence. You can have um, collapsing. You can have reorganization. In the technical community, you can have death and destruction. People's lives at stake here because we don't know what we're doing. We're running these large, complex systems, and we don't understand why they fail. We try. We do the investigations. We go back, oh, it was a brake system. Oh, it was this. So, well, but why couldn't we have predicted that? We know how brake systems work. We know how signaling systems work. Why can't we predict it? Turns out that we can't. But in this emergence, some fun stuff, which we're going to get to later in our little panel discussion, public-private partnerships, other new ways to do organization, other forms of government even begin to emerge out of this. And that's the good news is that we can find our way forward. So three quick little problems here. Problems we're going to have to solve if we agree that we have entered into a world of chaotic technology and 
managing chaos. The first is that management problem. Are we organized to manage our way through this chaotic system? A lot of the federal government, what I deal with in my daily life down in Washington, a lot of the federal government is based on a model that was perfected back in the 1930s during the Great Depression when they studied the Ford Motor Company and they looked at how Ford had organized assembly line processes, repeatable tasks, eight-hour shifts, you know, Bob here, John here, Terry here, Alice, whomever. They all know exactly what to do. They all have supervisors who have supervisors very hierarchical and it worked great if you're in a linear world. We are no longer in that linear world. The threats aren't linear, the actors aren't linear, the systems aren't linear, and our own government is struggling with how do you manage this stuff because we've transitioned to a different world. And I would argue that most of you, wherever you are, whoever you work for, whatever you do, are likely in that type of mindset, that type of organization that is having a very hard time adapting to this new chaotic world that doesn't look like the 1930s, doesn't look like where we were before. Second problem, individual humans. We have a hard time, even though our brains are chaotic and our, and our bodies are chaotic, we have been adapted to live in a linear world, a predictable world, a world where we want to have control over things. And so humans that try and run large systems, like let's take, this is the, the tail fin of the Air France plane that crashed as it flew out of Brazil a few years ago. I don't know if you remember this case or not. It took off out of Brazil at night was going to transit the Atlantic Ocean and land in Paris the next morning. Somewhere over the Atlantic, it just disappears, falls off the radars. The next day, they find a few pieces of debris out on the ocean. That's all the remains they have of it that's out there. Turns out, in the end, this airplane crashes because it's a completely computerized fly-by-wire aircraft. The pilots cannot control it. They, they're, when they're driving it, they're sending signals to a computer, and the computer's flying the airplane. There was no manual override. And they literally flew the airplane right into the ocean because their senses, their cognitive senses, were unable to rationalize what the computers were doing as they flew this thing into the ocean, killing people. Third problem, when we talk about security as a science, security itself is complex. It's really the sum of many, many things. It's different types of policies. It's different types of people. It's also technology. I've just made up a couple of equations here since we're in a school of higher learning. We can throw equations up here. It's fun stuff, right? They're totally meaningless, but, but you could have something like this, a, a function, you know, that's based on these various uh, policies, human software. There's policies, human software, you know, raised to some exponent. I mean, yeah, you could, this, by the way, is what a chaos equation might look like. This, depending on initial starting variables, you could have a nice linear laminar flow or it can go chaotic on you. All depends on what the initial values are. Which of those describes security? I don't know. I'll leave that to one of y'all to write a PhD thesis on it and figure it out. But I can tell you that this stuff is hard. It's complex. It's not predictable. And while we may be able someday to boil it down to a math equation, that's great, that's wonderful, that's good PhD work, how does that help us now? How does that make us move forward? How do we get to the end of this problem so that we become more secure? So a question that's beginning to emerge, or maybe an answer that's beginning to emerge, is that failure is normal. We should expect failure. We should embrace failure. Be prepared for failure. Deal with failure. Quit trying to shoot for perfection, like I was showing you on that first slide. We will never get risk down to zero. Failure will happen. So are you prepared for it, even in your own individual lives? Are you prepared for failure? Can you survive it? Can you get on to the next phase? Or are you living your life expecting that everything will always be perfect, that I can always manage everything around me, and when failure does happen, you're totally shocked because it's like, how could this have ever come to pass? You're not prepared for failure. And as a society, we need to think about that also because as you build large, complex, chaotic systems, they will fail. The internet someday may, I can't say will, may collapse. If it does, are we prepared for that? The power grid may collapse. We may have to go without electricity for a year. Are we prepared for that? It's the kind of thinking we've got to get our heads into that this will happen. Where it happens, how it happens, who knows? So some solutions. Let's start thinking about how to get out of this mess. How <laughs> do we get back you know, to, to that nice little comfort zone? Before you walked in the door this morning, when you were first drinking your coffee and thinking, wow, what a nice steamy day in New York City. This is going to be, yeah, we want to get back to that world of comfort, right? 
Organizational theory is probably a good place to begin. I was talking about that a moment ago, the fact that most of our organizations are thinking linear, predictable. Maybe we ought to rethink that a bit. Of course, that's a policy problem. That's not really a technology issue. That's all about public policy, governmental policy, and so forth. Response. We, we tend to think in terms of organized response. I'm going to call out the National Guard. I'm going to call the police department. I'm going to have some group of people who are trained, the fire department, whomever, FEMA, something like that's going to respond. Well, it turns out in cyberspace when there are emerging events, response that works tends to be fairly ad hoc. In other words, groups just come together. People who've never met each other emerge. And remember, emergence is part of a chaotic system. Things just come together. It proves that this is actually what's going on. So we need to embrace it. We may have bureaucracies. We may have top-down approaches, but we need to embrace the idea of ad hoc emergence of groups that understand the security problem, can solve the security problem, and then they break apart. How many of you worked Configure a few years ago? Do you remember that? Malware running around the internet? So this thing called the Configure Working Group is a ex perfect example of this. 20, 30 engineers kind of came together out of nowhere, figured out what Configure was, started putting the messages out, grew to a few hundred in the end. Once they had it solved, it, they all went away. It was not an organization, wasn't an institution. It was ad hoc, and it worked. Technologies themselves, fundamental flaws, the things I was talking about early on with built-in problems inside the Internet, we've got to come to grips with that. We can't keep running these global multi-billion dollar networks built on sand. We've got to get rid of the sand. We've got to go back into the soul of the networks. This is good academic thinking. This is good basic research. This is something we've kind of lost the ball on. We've not done a lot of basic science research in terms of how networks network and how computers compute things like that. We've got to get back into that world and quit just building applications on top of this sandy bottom that we've been building on top of. And, you know, same sort of thing with the networks, those fundamental flaws that we need to fix. So another solution that's been growing a lot in Washington and a lot of other places is information sharing, almost like it's a holy grail. If we could just get everybody together and just tell each other what we have, share, 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 the problem goes away. Rationally, that makes sense, right? So that the more I know about what you know and the more we share things, the better we can get, the quicker we can get to a solution and move forward. However, if I take the, say, the private and public sectors, the traditional model, Secret Service, comes to me and says, Mark, what do you know about this? I tell them, I'm picking on the Secret Service because they're sitting here. And I tell them everything I know. What does the government say? Thanks. And they take my secrets back. And I'll never hear from them again. I'm being totally unfair. But I think you get the picture, right? Or pick the FBI, or pick Coast Guard, or pick the military, pick anybody, pick the MSI SAC. Yeah, well, you'll have your turn too in just a second, Well, What we really need to get to is a, rather than tell me what you know as the starting point of the conversation, it's here's what I know. I'm going to give you something. Take a look at what I have. And then if you feel like there's something you need to contribute, in other words, you're reversing the model. Rather than asking for information, give the information. It's a really neat idea. And if you start approaching information sharing from that angle, then actually we do begin to share. Sharing does become the giving of information rather than the receiving of information. And we start moving towards this confidence building beyond the old trust but verify stuff where I really have confidence in you as a person, an organization, a group, that I can give you something, you will protect what I gave you, and I know something's going to come back. That that trust really, really, really gets strong between people. But folks, this is hard. If it were easy, I wouldn't be standing here, right? <laughs> We'd be out doing this stuff. And there's lots of reasons why it's hard. There are mismatches in technologies, mismatches in protocols, procedures, taxonomies. There's legal problems. I'll discuss a couple of these in just a second. There's lots and lots and lots of barriers, particularly in the private sector. Many, many of my senior masters don't want to get into the sharing stuff, and they'll list all kinds of reasons why this is bad. You don't want to do that. But when you start taking away those barriers and you make them go away, you still have this cultural thing of, yeah, but, but it's my secret. I, I don't want to share my secret with somebody else. So again, this is where it's going to take some group, some person, some, somebody to make the first offering of, here's what I know take that first step 
break that ice, move forward. And again, we've got to rethink how we cooperate, how we work together in this world. To get participation, to really drive this thing, if you're in business, we use a, a term called ROI, return on investment. This is a hard thing in the security world. Go to one of my financial people and say, hey, I need a few tens of millions of dollars to invest in some security system, firewalls, IDSs, blah, 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 new antivirus software. They're like, so yeah, but what's the return? How much money do I get back? Where's the profit? Remember, businesses are based on profit and loss. You've got to pay your shareholders, employees. You've got to worry about infrastructure. Now, I, I've been in the government longer than I've been in business. <laughs> I look at the government and say, is there a P&L there? Is there a profit and loss? Well, I'd say that L column is pretty big when it comes to the government versus the profit side. But you can't really say P&L in the government. But it's the same mindset. What can the government do that brings it an ROI? What is ROI? for the public sector. That has to be defined in, in this world. So we need to be able to somehow show that sharing information, moving this stuff around, makes a company more valuable or makes a government organization more efficient or whatever it is you want to build into this mix, that's our challenge. How do we do that? How do we increase the people who want to play? One thing we're cautioning Congress, by the way, mandatory reporting, mandatory information sharing is not the way to go. Then you'll wind up in a, in a culture of compliance, much like we already see in many other sectors, where I have to report certain things, I have to fill out certain forms, I have to have something turned in on a certain date, so now I employ all these employees of mine who could be out doing real good stuff for my company or my organization. No, they're just filling out forms and they're complying. And we drive to the bottom, and security becomes a very low thing. We just check the block. Am I compliant? So that's bad. We don't want to do that. We don't want to go down that road except as a last resort. So I mentioned uh, some legal barriers. Just for me, from a comm sector perspective, communication sector, we, as you probably imagine, as we run all of our global networks, and this is not just Verizon, it includes AT&T and Level 3 and Comcast and Sprint and countless others that are all in this big soup that we call the communications infrastructure, we are required by law to protect your information as private citizens from your government. That's a good thing, by the way, because if you think about this, everything you're doing online, we have to be able to see what you're doing in order to move the information between two of you. If you're going to tweet, if you're going to make a phone call, if you're going to click a link, we've got to know what you're doing in order to make it work so that you get the interactions that you're looking for. Well, as you can imagine, the government was very interested in, hey, can you slip me a couple of secrets about what this guy's doing over here? We don't look forth if I'm protecting myself, my own routers, my own switches, and so forth. I'm allowed by law to dig into that information to protect myself. I'm not allowed to look into that information to protect somebody else, unless that somebody else has given me consent to look at the information. And then I can only just tell that somebody else. I can't swivel chair around and tell the government unless I have a court order. So it gets very complex. But if I have a cyber event going on, I've got an attack happening, I've got a theft of information, I don't have 90 days to go get a court order. I might have 90 seconds to make some kind of decision. And that's where the awkwardness of these old laws, and we've got to rethink how we do this, but we also have to think in terms of today's privacy, civil liberties, all the things that we embrace as a society still have to be there. So these are legal challenges that, that we're working on. In Washington, working with our lawmakers on the Hill, there's a consistent message that we're trying to put out. First off, if you're reading the headlines, and many times the briefings and presentations make things look a whole lot worse than they really are, in spite of what I just showed you with all the, the, the real world, no kidding problems that we face, cyberspace is a pretty cool place to be, and there's a lot of good that's going on. There's a lot of bad as well, but it's not as bad as some would like to make it sound. So we want our lawmakers to be very rational in their approach. We don't want them necessarily going chaotic when it comes time to write laws and legislation. We want these to be very, very thoughtful. Well, three areas that we're pushing hard. We want to see the government set the example. If the government feels that there's something the private sector should be doing, whatever that something is, well, government, why don't you go ahead and go first? Show us how it's done. Set the example. Lead. Don't, don't expect us to do things you're not doing. That makes sense, right? Likewise, strong partnerships. As we've been talking about over and over, no one organization can solve these problems. No one group is going to make cyberspace secure. It truly has to be a partnership. Groups have got to get together. We've got to share. We've got to think. We've got to analyze as partners, not as 
regulator and regulatee, or lawmaker, law obeyer, obeyer, etc. That we've got to be more of a, of a partnership. And then finally, awareness and preparedness. The general public often is unaware of what happens when you click a link or when you stick a USB key in. There's this assumption that somebody's in charge out there, somebody's protecting me, and all is well in cyberspace. I don't have to worry about these things because somebody else is taking care of it. We've got to get over that. We've got to start getting people to think in terms of that somebody else, that's you. As an individual, it starts with you. And this preparedness begins with awareness and then starts growing from there. So even at the community and local level, we become more prepared for this. If I look at the Congress, the big Congress, and what they're working on, cybersecurity is certainly something I see a lot of, but you as individuals, unless this is the world you work in, most citizens are more worried about the economy. They're more worried about whether I'm going to get a paycheck, do I have a job, can I get my home mortgage paid for. They're looking at other issues. We're waiting right now for the Supreme Court to have a ruling on health care. Nowhere in all this mess, and by the way, I've talked to many lawmakers who are going for re-election or regular election this coming fall, are they campaigning on cybersecurity? Are they seeking votes? Vote for me because I'm out there working for you to make cyberspace more secure. No, <laughs> I don't see that happening. Will President Obama campaign against Romney on cybersecurity? You know, I will bring you a stronger cyber, you know, cyberspace. Will Romney do that? I'm going to bring you, no, of course not. So it's kind of awkward there because most lawmakers get very oriented on what gets them votes. It's not saying cyberspace is not important, it's just not as important as some of these other more social oriented issues. So over in the House, there's been some efforts. There is a bill that's gone through the House called the CISPA bill. Senate's been messing around and messing around. We're hoping that sometime in the month of June, maybe July, Senate's going to pass something so we have a Senate side and House side we can bring them together. Most gamblers, though, are saying nothing's going to happen this year. We'll hit the elections. There won't be any cyber bills. We may go into what they call the lame duck session, which is the session that happens after the election. You know what the big focus of lame duck's going to be? It's your tax cuts. Remember the Bush tax cuts? They run out at the end of this year. That has got, they've got to come to grips with that. Either they come to grips with it before the election or they come to grips with it after the election. But I don't think they're too worried about passing a cybersecurity act when you have these tax cuts sitting in front of you and many other things that they're going to be worried about. So that's the reality of what's happening inside of Washington. So let me wrap all this up now and we'll take a couple of questions uh, before we transition into the, the panel here. We keep talking about public-private partnerships. Let me just show you a few examples. Again, this is a communication sector, the world I live in view. The financial sector has theirs. Transportation has theirs. There are many that exist. But in communications, we, we tend to divide up the world into three big buckets. We have operational partnerships, planning partnerships, and policy partnerships. We anchor in the communications sector on, on what's called the NSTAC, the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. This is CEOs of telecom companies and telecom-like companies, people that build equipment and stuff, that meet with the president, eyeball to eyeball with the president, and work on matters of national strategic, national security, emergency preparedness types of policies. And we've been doing this since the early 80s. It's a very, very well thought out, well run, public-private partnership at the presidential level. By the way, this is not political. You'll never see this as an R versus D type of thing. It's all just done professionally off on the side as strategic policy coordination and development at that level. We've got other stuff more down at the planning level where we have the coordinating councils where I'm the vice chair of the one in the comm sector. Uh, all 18 of the critical infrastructure sectors have these coordinating councils. Some are real good, some just barely exist. Uh, we've got cross-sector working groups where we've got many sectors coming together, again, doing more of the planning for things. Now, at the operations level, the, the law enforcement side, two really good ones. U.S. Secret Service has the Electronic Crimes Task Force that we and many others participate in. The FBI has their InfraGuard where we share information. Really good stuff happening down there. We've also got integration centers and ISACs that are working together. Can better be done? Absolutely we can do better. The point is, these things do exist. It's not like we're having to start from scratch. But we've got to do better, folks. And we've got to get more people thinking about, more people working on this together. Another one, before I move along, the supply chain thing, this is very interesting. The Defense Department 
came to the comm sector a couple of years ago and said, you know, we're very worried because we run all of our defense communications over a network that we don't own. It's run by the private sector. And is it possible for our adversaries to get in and install equipment and stuff inside of your networks that could be hazardous to the Defense Department? Absolutely fair question. So we've been working in a partnership role with DOD and with DHS to try and figure out, is this really a threat? Can we actually have inside of our networks poisoned products that could change or affect the missions of the federal government, both DOD and DHS and others? And what we're finding is very, very scary stuff. But we're working together to fix the problem versus the government just coming in and doing all the research themselves and then issuing regulations to the private sector. That's the old model, the old way of doing it. So this is good. It's all good stuff. Again, you've got, I don't know what I did with my, co my copy, oh, there it is. This is another good example of public-private partnering. Verizon came up with this idea about five years ago where we had been doing breach analysis. We're looking into companies that have been broken into, digital breaches, and we found that we had all this information, all these case studies, things that we had looked at, and we put them together, took that database, and we built a report. It says, here's the trends. Here's how the bad guys get in. Then we said, you know, we ought to start looking at other data sets. What else has happened? And very quickly we found that the Secret Service had the same sort of information that Verizon had. What happens when you take Verizon's case information and you combine it with the Secret Service's information? Very interesting results come out of it. You find first off that many of the trends are the same. In other words, how people are breaking in, what causes failure inside of breached companies, it turns out it's often very much the same information. And I'm not going to read the report. Please read through it. It's, it. By the way, this is not a survey of CEOs or CISOs. This is what the machines are telling us. This is good old analytical analysis here of quantifiable stuff. Then we added in the Dutch high-tech crime unit, uh, the UK. We're seeking lots of other, outside the United States, other organizations now to be part of this. So in the fifth year, we now have analysis based not just on what Verizon and the private sector is seeing, but also combined what the public sector is seeing, not just in the United States, but even abroad. Very powerful public-private partnership. And it all starts with an organization that says, here's what I have, can you take a look at it? And that organization says, wow, here's what I have, can you take a look at that? And you build that information sharing partnership, and that's how we get ahead of some of these problems. So what do you do as individuals? How can you be a part of this? How do you help? Doesn't matter where you are in the ladder of life. Somebody is your boss. <laughs> okay, even if you're the tippy top president of the university or the CEO of the company, you still got a daddy. There's still somebody above you that you answer to. And you know what I'm talking about, right? Even if you're at the top of your game, there's still somebody out there you've got to answer to. You have to get those people above you involved. They have to be concerned. They have to understand that this is a problem. This is something you have to work on. There are other little simple things. That, you know, we, we've all seen this. Turn things off, apply antivirus, yada, yada, yada. Of course you want to do all that. But let me get real specific on some of the things we have found in our report aimed at two different types of organizations. If you're a big, big enterprise, and we're talking hundreds, maybe thousands of employees, multiple sites and so forth, the biggest killer right now that's getting everybody, what we're finding, is data that you don't need. And largely data that you don't know that you have. Sitting out there where somebody can steal it. If you don't need it, get rid of it. Delete it. Make it go away so that somebody can't steal it. Essential controls, password policies, firewall rules. Most of the break-ins that are happening today, most of what this cyber criminal world is going after uses what we call low-hanging fruit. There's so many open windows, so many open doors, they just walk in. So just do the basics. <coughs> Event logging. What I'm talking about here? Recording everything that happens on your networks. Because if you do have a break-in, you go back and try and figure out what happened. If you don't have any logs, there's no way to know what happened. There's no way for an investigator, no way for law enforcement, no way for anybody to try and help you understand what happened if you have no logs, nothing to look at. Well, by the way, if you are doing logging, read your logs. You know, take a look at them from time to time because your machines know when they've been breached. They know when they're having problems. They're trying to tell you, I've got a problem. But if you're not looking at what the machines are telling you, you don't see it. And the final thing is prioritization. You cannot do everything. Remember that risk line. There's always pieces at the bottom you will never get down to. So come up with a priority. What's most important to you and start working your way down. Now that's for big enterprises. 
What if I'm a little guy or an individual at home? How simple is using a firewall? How simple is that? But yet what we find when we look at small organizations, why do I need a firewall? I'm connected to Verizon or I'm connected to Comcast. They're going to protect me. No, folks. We're going to give you the backwash of the Internet. <laughs> Book your little line up to me and here you go. It's on you to figure out what you want. Now, you can work with us. You can work with your upstream, doesn't matter who your ISP is, us, AT&T, cable company, whomever. You can work with us and we can do some filtering, but you've got to think about protecting yourself. It's no different than locking your doors or making your kids take their toys in from outside at night and putting them in the house. It's that same mindset. You've got to start yourself, protect yourself as a small business. Big businesses are already doing this. Default credentials, big killer. When I buy something new, which could be a photo frame, it could be a new computer, it could be a uh, wireless router that I get from Best Buy, they all come with default credentials. You know what I'm talking about? Admin is the login, admin is the password. Before you hook it up to the internet, just change it. Come up with something else. It doesn't matter what you come up with, just come up with something else. The criminal community will always try the default stuff first, and they always win, because so much default equipment is sitting out there. And then finally, find other third parties that are doing security and listen to what they say. Again, for small businesses, small organizations, listen to them. They're experts at this. They can tell you what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. Pay attention to the words of the experts that are out there. So I appreciate everybody staying alive. We've got a minute or two, or you want to save questions for later, or what's the, how's the timing looking? A couple of questions. Thank you. Um, Mark, this was uh, one of the most stimulating talks uh, about a very technical field that I've ever uh, had the pleasure Thank of uh, being in the audience. And uh, my great appreciation on my behalf, on behalf of the audience. Thanks very much. So uh, you talked earlier about some hardware problems. Uh, uh, fake hardware, and we have a question from uh, someone in the audience uh, or on the World Wide Web, because you know this is being filmed, uh, 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 webcast, and if you want to show your colleagues at your organization or your husband or your wife or your kids what went on today, uh, you can go to poly.edu slash live, and uh, you can get the, it's archived there, and you can get this uh, uh, entire presentation that the Mark just gave and, and also the uh, panel's discussion uh, if you go there. That's poly.edu slash live. Um, so uh, are there any publicized cases, uh, it says here, of fake hardware doing anything nefarious like data collection and uh, distribution? Uh, yes, okay, so fake hardware doing real things. It, one, one side I'd like to point you to, there's a um, a group called attrition.org. Many of you back in the, the old hacker days probably remember attrition was documenting all the uh, defaced websites. So they've captured, this goes back to roughly 1990-91, what they call certified pre-owned equipment. Now they spell owned the hacker way with a zero, right? And what they mean by pre-owned, they're talking about stuff that's already pre-infected, already has malware, already has something inside of it. If you go to attrition.org, slash errata, E-R-A-T-A. -A. Um, I think you'll see it listed right there. But take a look at that list. You will see hundreds of devices that are with links to the press statements, with links to articles about them that show what you have been exposed to. Many of them are consumer devices. Some of them are line cars like we talked about before. And these cases, it hasn't stopped. There continues to be more of these. Uh, there are many press reports of these cases happening. And it's not just... Um, counterfeit in the sense of bad labeling and so forth, but even counterfeit to the point of targeting organizations to put things inside that organization so that it sniffs, so that it listens, so that it brings information back out. Even that's a form of counterfeiting in its, in its own way. Um, the, the example I always do like to cite where you'd like, if you'd like to read more about it, is back to the organization I used to run, the Sands Internet Storm Center. At Christmas 2007, so the end of 2007, early 2008, there was a rash of pre-infected digital photo frames 
So this would be you go down to your local Target, Walmart, Costco, wherever you buy things. You buy a photo frame as a gift for somebody. You give them to them during the holiday season. They unwrap it. They plug it into their computer, and the computer blue screens. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? Microsoft failure. Turns out these photo frames, and there were many of them, already had malicious code pre-embedded in the frame, ready for when it got plugged into a Microsoft operating system, ready to start taking information off of it. We documented all that back on the SANS Internet Storm Center. So if you, if you go to that website, go back to the end of 07, early 08, you can read all about it, all the real life case studies that were going on, and there's been many others. So great question. It's real stuff. Uh, there's a question about the international implications of sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, author of this question says, are there additional concerns with regard to public-private partnerships for the company that has an international presence? So the, the biggest issue internationally is what do we do about the different laws in the different countries? We face this, of course, being in, in 150 some odd countries. It's not just the United States or just Canada or just China or just uh, Japan or Germany or wherever. Every country has a different set of laws we have to listen to. Some mandate information sharing. Breach reporting, for example. Even in the United States, we have 50 different states that have 50 different sets of laws about mandatory information sharing, although they call it more mandatory reporting. So it's first a legal question, what must you share? Then it becomes a cultural question. Can you trust who you're sharing it with? Can you build those bonds back and forth? And it turns out that in most countries, you can do that. Most are working above board. Most are very interested in sharing because it's a common problem that we're all trying to solve. Some aren't like that. Very much to the, to the question that, that the, the audience member is bringing up, there are some countries where it might be dangerous or disadvantaged to share. Uh, no clear answer there except try and be the change. Try and be the driver of change. Try and build those partnerships as best as you can, but recognize no one solution fits all. And there are going to be countries where this approach just may not work due to the culture or due to the laws. And uh, one final question before we have a break and before we uh, have the panelists um, comment on what you've said this morning, uh, because I think uh, it raises a number of questions that the panelists who are experts in this area might uh, want to challenge or confirm. Mm -hmm. uh, the final question is, how does one balance sharing information with responsible disclosure? If I, have, um, if I know a zero day of Windows, should I post it publicly to everyone at the same time, including attackers? That's a great question. In fact, that used to be the model. Through the 1990s, up to eh, maybe 02, 03 time frame, uh, bug track, remember bug track? So a researcher finds a problem someplace, they could post it on bug track, other researchers could confirm that there was a problem, you work with the vendor, you work it out, a patch happens. That was back when that information had very little value. And people were willing to share information about zero days, about vulnerabilities, because the perceived value was actually in the sharing of information rather than the exploitation of the information. Since about 10 years ago, the inflection point is roughly 02-ish or so, it turns out that that information now has more value to the attack community than it does to the research community or the software community that owns the problem. And so it's valuable to not share it, but instead sell it to somebody and hope to profit from it. And a whole new industry has been developed around the research and the sale of exploitation information versus the discovery and the sharing of exploitation information. So the question is, if we now know that that's what's happened and we're working in a world where there is value to this, if you want to take an exploit and put it out where everybody can see it, yeah, you can do that, but it's a lot more valuable to sell it to somebody. <laughs> so in a twisted way, is it possible to create a market, and this in fact has happened, where the good guys are encouraging research to find bugs and are willing to pay for it? Because they recognize that's what's stimulating this environment. There is value there. Create a market. Let the market bring it to you. Does that mean that stuff will leak out? Of course. Can you achieve perfection? Of course not but you've got to think differently. The rules have changed, and you will never get to zero. That curve, that asymptotic curve, never hits zero, so quit aiming for zero. What can you do in that area where you can do something about? And perhaps rethinking the value of exploits, the value of zero days, may be a way ahead in order to, to protect ourselves better. You just, we've got to think differently about these problems. 
Thanks, Mark, and thanks the audience for. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, now uh, I, we'll turn our attention to Nasser, who will introduce our um, panelists. Nasser. So after the great talk, we have a great set of panelists. Uh, uh, the, they represent the business. Mm -hmm. As uh, Marcus brought up, the team of public-private partnerships. And now in the panel, we have people from the government, from the state government, uh, and business who will address these issues, talk about their own experiences with re related to uh, forming public-private partnerships and the challenges they think they have faced and they think that need to be overcome. Uh, and after the, uh, they, will e they will each uh, make initial comments, and after that, we will have a sort of break out into a discussion and invite questions from the audience. And, and uh, so uh, the first panelist I'd like to introduce is a great friend of Holly, uh, Dr. Edward Amoroso. He's the senior vice president and chief security officer for AT&T, uh, a job that puts him in charge of protecting one of the largest communication companies in the world. AT&T has more than 100 million wireless customers and 16 million broadband connections. Uh, Ed's 26 career at AT&T began at Bell Labs where he worked on securing the Unix operating system as well as federal government security initiatives. More recently, he has championed AT&T's network-based security strategy uh, centered around cloud protection services. He has authored many research papers, articles, and, uh, articles, and also five books on in information security. I remember reading his books uh, uh, as a graduate student when I was first learning about security. So, uh, and uh, at NYU Poly, uh, Ed has perhaps been our strongest ally in encouraging students to expand their skills mm. through our annual Cybersecurity Awareness Week Seesaw Challenges. He's been a big supporter of Seesaw. Uh, the, as you know, the Seesaw Contest, they draw hundreds of top students from around the globe. and. Uh, and we all know that there's a desperate need for uh, cyber talent. So Ed, Ed has been really uh, a great supporter of NYU Poly. And, and I um, well, hi, everybody. So when um, Mark and, and uh, Nasser called and said, why don't you come over, I'm, I pay an undergraduate tuition to NYU. So I heard there'd be like bagels and coffee. If I was come get a free breakfast so that uh, tuition that we pay time uh, everything he said right on the money is really good uh, discussion I think that uh, represents the, the sector well exactly right um, I think there are four big problems that are relevant to kind of protecting infrastructure one is that we don't know how to stop denial of service attacks right now so if you're a grad student or if you're just in business um, really really vital problem of what happens when somebody overwhelms you with a bunch of stuff, just the physics of that. I'm not sure anybody has a good problem or a good answer to it. You have 40 gig pipe, somebody's throwing 80 gig, do the math, right? Um, it causes things to get clogged. So, so that's one big problem. The second is mo mobility security, and that's that um, you build up all these big systems and companies and in government. <laughs> And we push all our local area network traffic to these points, these gateways that push out to the internet. You hire a bunch of smart kids out of poly and you have them manage the firewalls and intrusion detection systems. Then everybody walks in with Androids and iPhones, they dance right around all that stuff. And it sort of makes the existing architecture look like it's um, a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of wasted time, right? And with uh, 4G, the ubiquitous 4G from all the carriers domestically and um, IP version 6 making everything addressable. I mean, you have everything just connected out to 4G networks and what's the point of a perimeter anymore? And then we all go, hmm, that's uh, been the backbone of what, what we do. So mobility security is kind of a big um, question. The third one is cloud, right? Everybody trying to push things out into the cloud. And there's some alliances that you've all heard about, Cloud Security Alliance and some others. They have good requirements. So, but when, when something exciting pops up, like iCloud or Siri or whatever, everybody just runs to it. And that may be fine, but in terms of security, it's not clear always where your data is going. That may be all right, maybe not. But we've got a big 
question on what you do there. And then the fourth is APT, and that's that it's become astoundingly simple for someone to just drop software into your enterprise and use that as a point of scanning. Like I bet at any, even in um, you know, places that are well policed, like um, uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, if we stage a big APT, just drop something in and try scanning, or an ATT, or any, any company, uh, it's amazing how tough it is to pick that stuff up, you know, and uh, that's how most of the data leakage goes on. So those big four questions are ripe for academic analysis, ripe for product, ripe for change. At CIS, we talk a lot about these uh, types of things. So uh, I, I suspect during the discussion, some of those themes might uh, pop up. So thanks for the invite. Looking forward to the discussion. Always love coming to visit. I would like to in, uh, introduce the next pa panelist, uh, William Pelgrin. Uh, William is a noted expert on the government policy side of security uh, and another strong advocate of collaboration between government and private sector. Uh, Will is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Internet Security, a nonprofit that fosters public-private cooperation in order to advance cybersecurity readi readiness. Uh, it has a responsibility for the multi-state information sharing and analysis center. Uh, Will founded the center to coordinate the efforts of state, local, territorial, and tribal governments to share information with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He also founded and leads the public-private -priv sector cybersecurity work group of talented professionals and academics in New York and New Jersey who ex explore answers to cyber threats. Uh, he was appointed to brief the Obama administration on critical cybersecurity issues. Uh, he is in his third te term as chair of the National uh, Council that protects our critical infrastructure. So. First, good morning. Second, um, that was way too long of an introduction, but I usually want people to just say, hi, here's Will. Um, and I didn't get the memo. Blue, blue, blue. <laughs> I'm wearing a jacket, <laughs> so uh, if anybody knows me, my PowerPoint presentations are 180 slides, three videos, uh, you know, 300 meg. Uh, this is not a, a, another PowerPoint presentation. Uh, but I'm a visually oriented individual, so I really wanted to go th through quickly um, when we were asked uh, by Nasir and, and Marcus to come together to talk about um, public-private partnerships and in the true meaning of what partnerships are, uh, I was really excited about it. And I thought about whether or not we're going to have any controversy, because I like controversy in panels, and so far I concur with Ed. Everything Mark has said so well uh, is square on point. I always start anything with regardless how small my PowerPoint presentation is, remembering the past, and 9-11 affected all of us in very deep ways. But you need to remember in order to change the future. So what did we learn from that horrific event? One of the things that I learned during that uh, time period was information sharing must be second nature. It can't be something that we have to think about. It's got to be uh, as uh, instinctive as buckling your seatbelt when you get into your car. Uh, one of the things that I think came out of that event as well is that the relationship between the physical and cyber side are now so entwined that we can't separate them. And to think of them in stovepipe really does us a disservice because we'll never have as maximum security. And I concur also with Marcus saying that 100% security doesn't exist. Uh, you do want to achieve uh, maximum security as much as you can. So uh, why is information sharing essential in this digital world? Uh, because we're under persistent attack. These are real attacks. We uh, actually um, track our attacks to uh, Google. Um, these are geographic points, so when you click on it, it expands. And if I clicked on any one of those, it would expand exponentially. Uh, so we're constantly defending ourselves against those who want to do us harm. Um, why is information sharing important? It's also because of and Ed uh, went through the, the four, I have uh, almost all of the four, uh, mobile devices, they're getting more creative, they're getting smaller, they're getting more unique every single day. Uh, thumb drives, uh, Marcus talks about thumb drives, and I thought that analogy of the Trident gum is, is phenomenal. If I ever use it, your name's going to go by Marcus Sachs because it's just great. Uh, uh, but here's a, a, a guy that is dangerous, 
Uh, don't approach them. Uh, call law enforcement. Take them down. Anybody that has that many thumb drives is a danger to your organization. The human factor. We have to recognize that we're all human. The interface to the computer is you. Uh, we're going to do stupid things. I had a theory. The theory was that if I'm your boss and I send you an email with an attachment and I tell you that that attachment has malware, malicious code in it, and if you open that up, it will destroy the computer, it will steal the data, and it will cause havoc in our company. 20% of you will go ahead and click on it anyhow. <laughs> I thought that was a theory. There was a um, phishing uh, exercise that was done in which, uh, you know, these pop-up ads that come up and this one came up and it actually said, uh, you know how it says it would click here to scan your computer? This one said, click here to get your computer infected now. 409 people went ahead and clicked on it anyhow, even though they were telling you it's going to get infected. Uh, fishy. Uh, we all think we're brighter uh, than the fish and, and that there is no way that we're going to get caught of this. Uh, I'm just so thankful for my 86-year-old mother is, uh, doesn't have a computer. She still calls me. Uh, and tells me when she gets in the mail that she's won the lottery, even though she hasn't played in years. It, you know, I won, and it, it was from, from you know, it could be from London. So she is the one that would click on anything and then call me later on and said, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Uh, and then APT, as Ed uh, described as well. So this is really important. Let me give you two case studies of why information sharing is really essential. We did one with the law enforcement entity recently. Um, which I'm very pleased that while uh, the example that Marcus gave about uh, law enforcement sometimes you, you share and sometimes you don't get it back or with government you share and you don't get it back. Early on, this was many years ago, we found a case uh, and it was a criminal case. We brought it to a law enforcement entity. They took it. They were very excited about it. They went forward. I called to find out what was happening. They said, we can't tell you. It's law enforcement sensitive. I know that. I gave it to you and I have the information back. That's changed, you know, and we're not perfect yet, but it has changed tremendously. This was a small case, $30,000 case, financial fraud of an educational institution. Um, it would have gone nowhere from a criminal perspective, most likely. Uh, we worked with the law enforcement community. We did the forensics on it. We found out that there were 19 states, five FTP servers that was uh, harvesting uh, personal information at such a rate that the hackers needed to empty those, empty those servers out uh, frequently. Uh, four in this country, the FTP servers, one in a, another country, all going to a, another country. Um, so without that sharing, without that collaboration, without that partnership, that $30,000 case would have ended right there. An APT case that we worked very closely with a number of organizations, uh, the federal government, the, the fusion centers in the states, the, the uh, Justice Department at the FBI Bureau. Uh, we did that. We helped remediate uh, the situation. Um, and we had a lot of successes, the communication, the coordination, the rapid response. Uh, but we didn't sit back and just say, okay, that's over. What we did was to look at what we do as an organization and says any other entity may be similarly situated that we needed to go and uh, assist them. And we did, and we've been involved with another state relative to a potential case there as well. So how do you get started on this? Partnerships are absolutely key in my opinion. Together we can be successful. Uh, the philosophy is we can't do this alone. Uh, give more than you get back. Trust is earned. It's not of right. The multi-state ISAC, which I'm very fortunate to be part of, uh, has all 50 states. Uh, the local governments, which are 39,000 local governments, the five U.S. territories, and, and very soon the tribal nations. But it's built on a very strong foundation of trust, collaboration, sharing, including the private sector. Uh, it's all about situational awareness, and it's all bringing it together in a way uh, that makes uh, a sense not from sharing as an end state. That doesn't mean anything. It has to be an actionable uh, state. So we share with that to mean that that information can be used in a way to help either mitigate or prevent a situation from going on. Uh, real quickly who we are, uh, we have a 7 by 24 operational center. Uh, we monitor, uh, right now we're monitoring about half uh, the country. Uh, meaning that we have uh, state, local, territorial governments that have agreements with us to have devices so that we can look for malicious activities. Our, our main goal here, our core purpose, is to be value add only. Uh, I'm pleased to say the end kick that uh, Marcus Sachs talked about, uh, we are on the floor at that as well. So we have direct communication with the IT ISAC, with the communication ISAC, with the federal government, with the FBI Secret Service uh, on a, a minute to minute basis. Uh, the partnerships include many, uh, both from the government perspective as well as the private sector. Uh, I'm a big believer this has got to be about inclusion. We can't have anybody away from the table. 
Um, because guess what? The bad guys are talking. It's thus the good guys that are having a hard time or harder time about it. So do whatever possible. I'm a lawyer by education. I kept lawyers away from the table as often as I could because the, the discussion always turned on what can I share, how can I share, if I can share, and when can I share. For a year after I started the multi-state ISAC and our public-private partnership, I wouldn't let the lawyers come to the table and I took my lawyer's hat off. I looked at it as a safe haven. We needed to talk, we needed to share, and you could be comfortable that that information stayed uh, within those organizations that needed to know. Uh, lastly, the Cyber Threat Intelligence Group, this is now bringing the law enforcement community together. It was a goal of mine to say, we need to be able to sit down and break those down those walls. And I'm pleased to say right now we have the multi-state Homeland Security, FBI, Secret Service, Air Force, Fusion Centers, Local PD, uh, PD, uh, DHS at both the N uh, NCSD as well as the INA level. Customs and Border, or HSI as they're called now, State Police, the Homeland Security Advisors were out throughout all the, the states. Uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and uh, from because I'm from New York State, New York State uh, Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Response, that sit at the table every month and talk about actual uh, investigations, that talk about things that may not even be an investigation yet, but the things that may be going on. And because of that, this light bulb goes on, and the dots start to get connected about potential activity that may impact all of us. Again, the whole goal here is how do we take this information, get it actionable. Here's one of our products. Um, any one of those shields on it would have had an impact. To be able to have Secret Service, to have FBI, to have DHS, to have multi-state ISAC, the IT ISAC, the financial sector ISAC, issue joint uh, advisories with real uh, firm mitigation steps is really essential. Um, we also collaborate across the board. I was fortunate to be the chair of the uh, National Council of ISACs for three years. Um, that council brings the 18 critical sectors together. Uh, and now we're saying anybody else that's critical can come to the table regardless of being within those uh, sectors. Uh, this is my organization. I'm very proud of it. Uh, the multi-state's one of three divisions. Uh, security benchmarks, which we also uh, help for core configurations. And also I think that we have the opportunity to influence through the leveraging of our, our collective dollars. So uh, we look to help state, local, territorial, and tribal governments and not-for-profits leverage those dollars to improve their cybersecurity posture. So our final panelist is uh, Paul Mahone. Uh, Paul worked at the National Security Agency before joining the Secret Service in 1990. Uh, he is the assistant special agent in charge of the New York field office. Uh, over the years, he's been assigned to the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Division and the National Counterterrorism Center, among others. Uh, today, Paul supervises eight criminal in investigation squads, including the multi-agency electronic crimes task force, uh, network intrusion squad, and a multi-agency computer forensics lab. Uh, you may recognize Paul from press conferences that announced arrests of numerous uh, identity theft cases recently. Uh, the New York office has been particularly active in pursuing financial crime, uh, including overseas uh, intrusions, and Paul has been at the helm of that. Uh, uh, earlier on in his career, uh, as an electrical engineer at the NSA, Paul was instrumental in developing uh, military sensing technology that, use, that is used today to detect bombs. Uh, so Paul will... share information um, by our nature of uh, going back for the uh, prior to the creation of Department of Homeland Security we were pretty introverted um, one of the mandates of uh, DHS is to reach out for the private public sector to make sure that um, we are uh, an instrument to, to help them with whatever problems they have and secure the infrastructure of the United States to make sure it's robust in times of crisis um, to that end um, we have a uh, ECTF and under the Patriot Act, it was uh, allowed to grow. Our first ECTF started in February 1995, and I was fortunate enough to be part of that first squad. And it was a very humble beginning. But after 9-11, uh, um, we had more of a mandate uh, from Congress, uh, go ahead, to uh, reach out to the uh, public and private sector, and it has really flourished. The day before yesterday, we had a, um, a uh, ECTF conference. And in that conference, we call it accordingly. It was hosted by uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, we had over 100 different organizations with 230 people attending and about 35 percent 
of the uh, people attending were government agencies. So most of it was um, the uh, public sector. So with that, um, the goal is to uh, share information. And the one thing that we do say to anyone who does bring us a case um, is that we will keep it as confidential as you want to keep it. The one thing that Marcus said was, even with China and their problems with counterfeiting, they're worried about their brand. How do they sell? How do they function in the marketplace? And one of the things that was said during the uh, uh, quarterly reiterated uh, day before yesterday was that folks, corporations, are worried about their brand. Maybe 120 criminal cases are investigated. Three or four only go to prosecution. So corporations in and of themselves and, and, and folks that want to uh, make a profit are worried about the perception in, in the public sector. Um, and I'm here to tell you that if uh, you bring a case to, the, uh, to our ECTF, well, we will keep it as quiet as possible. When it does come down to prosecution, um, many of the uh, uh, prosecutors, again, want to tell the nation and, the, and, and their, their uh, constituents um, the good things they've done. We are working a case right now, and in it, um, through our efforts, uh, public disclosure has been made, but it hasn't brought um, any attention to the brand or the, the business that, that brought us the case. Um, I was flattered uh, to be invited here today. Um, the idea that uh, we could possibly build upon the structure that we've been working on so hard uh, since 2003 uh, can, uh, can be allowed to grow is, uh, is a very good thing. Um, now, whether it's uh, uh, advanced, advanced persistent threat or whether it's a, a criminal um, over in the Cayman Islands trying to uh, obtain uh, some kind of profit, um, we're willing to work the case. We work it uh, well in hand, and you'll find that it's a partnership. And if we can expand upon that, uh, we're thrilled to, to try to do so. Um, uh, also, um, you know, uh, with uh, the, the uh, folks that are assembled here with the, uh, the panel, um, if there are any questions, anything that we can answer, any ideas that can be brought forth, I'm willing to uh, take it back and see if we can expand upon it as, uh, again, a partnership between uh, you and the audience and uh, the panel, mem panel members up here. That's all I have. Uh, thank you. So perhaps I could uh, kick off the discussion with a question an ac academic would ask. Uh, what in your, uh, so we've seen that there are many examples of uh, these public-private partnerships, uh, many to just take place spontaneously due to the need, uh, some more structured and driven, and, and in some sense we are, we are getting there. Uh, and there's a lot, as Marcus pointed out, there's a lot more to do. Uh, uh, one question I, I, I would have as an ac academic is, is what role can academia play in this or should play or are there examples of uh, good things academia has done, not necessarily in cybersecurity but in other fields which we can emulate and, and how can academia start being a player in, in such partnerships maybe? Well, uh, I think one area clearly in, in terms of research, a lot of times <coughs> people think of academia as being more of a technical research area but a lot of this is driven by policy, by public policy. And so understanding how organizations interact and or play with each other is important. Um, if we could get some thinking, some research, some papers into where have we been, for example, over the last 10, 15 years as we've transitioned through these different technologies, these different organizations, pre-September 11th, post-September 11th, what has this done in terms of partnerships? Are there some insights there? Are there some examples that have worked? Are there case studies that have failed? to help, a, help inform us from more of a social policy kind of world versus let's dig into the technology and figure out how a buffer overflow works. And that's good, we need to do that, don't get me wrong. But if we want to really get into the information sharing, if we believe that this is where we need to go, then help us understand from organizational theory, from social theory, policy theory, why do some things work, why do some things not work? That'd be extremely helpful there. So I, I, I think that uh, that's correct. Um, but innovation is the, is, the, is the answer, right? I mean, uh, adversaries are innovating. I first started looking at attacks 30 years ago. Eh, pretty simple. Like a worm is a three-line program, right? Find a place to copy yourself, 
copy yourself there and then run. And what's it going to do? Find a place, copy, you know, spreads out. So it's sort of simple. Um, Stuxnet was a little more complicated than that, right? <laughs> so, so you get this, this exponential innovation and we're not doing that. We don't innovate um, in security. You, um, you're held back in many cases by compliance, right? Compliance incents us in business to argue that what we have is fine. Right? That's, what, that's what you do when you get a complaint. When somebody comes in with their clipboard, then you're pretty, you're, you're motivated to say, hey, whatever you're asking me about that clipboard, dude, I got it covered. You know, I got everything you need. It's all perfect, right? Not, hey, how do I challenge myself to do something different? Or God forbid, change, right? If you change and, and uh, you invalidate a, uh, an audit. So I think that the role of you know, academia, the role of all of us, is that in addition to sharing, we have to get on an exponential innovation curve. Look, go, go home and look at your little PC and ask yourself, how am I protecting that PC? You probably say I put a firewall, some AV, authentication, monitor a little bit, and then go to the largest corporation in America and ask them what they do. They'd say, hey, firewall, uh, passwords, AV, a policy, and you go, you know, do you protect a tricycle the same way you protect a 747? No. You know, so we like, have not innovated at all, and, and I really do think fundamentally that part of the problem, this sounds a little odd, is that we're so obsessed with compliance that it incents us to not change and to not innovate. So come up with cool stuff and then we'll want to do it and it becomes mainstream, I hope. Will, yeah. The only thing I'd add is that you have one of the most precious resources that we don't have. Uh, and it's the, the student population that you mentioned earlier last year. Um, when I started, well, I think when most of us started, we're close in the same age bracket. I was using carbon paper and, and a select typewriter to do anything. So um, the fact that the, this generation and the one you know, that's coming behind you and the one behind that uh, is really essential to keep what we do both at government and in the private sector to be at the fore. Um, our best uh, employees are, you know, those that are just coming out and having both the creativity, the passion, um, but to look at it from a different way than the way we looked at it. Do everybody remember the, the big Northeast blackout that we had, I think it was August and whatever year it was? Um, Unless you're Canadian. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Southeast blackout. That's right. Uh, and if you're in New York City, I mean, <laughs> it's just uh, <laughs> so. Um, I was asked to, to talk to, because we had a great working relationship with the utility sector, um, especially after 9-11, to, to, to task them with, was this a cyber event? Was this, uh, and you know, what we got back was this, this classical uh, engineering, electrical engineering discussion of how I learned more about how electrici electricity flows, but that wasn't the issue. Yes, it could have happened the way. The question was, could it have happened the other way as well? And we weren't thinking like that. We weren't thinking back then about those alternatives approaches to what could occur. Um, uh, you know, what I'm seeing now is that um, at least, you know, the employees that we have, they're thinking way beyond the assignment. They're looking at it from a totally different perspective um, that we wouldn't do if we were looking at this traditional trajectory. So, uh, uh, you know, I think that that partnership is, is huge uh, to develop more of that into government, to use more of the, the student population into the private sector as well. So uh, when I look at it, and I've been in security for almost a decade now, and I, I look at what academia has done and I ask myself if the hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent in, in research grants to academia, has anything c good come out of it? I mean, uh, acad academia has done a good job at, at educating the workforce, and we are, we are putting out well-trained people. There's a great amount of awareness about cybersecurity in every university, programs, courses, much more than it was 10 years back. Uh, but has there been, in, like as Ed said, innovation, innovate, have there been innovations really that have come out from academics or it's more, been more from startups? And if no, then maybe it's, it's because uh, academia is not taking part in partnerships. Is there 
isolated in an ivory tower working on their own? Or is that the case? I mean, I, uh, no, I mean, I, I think, look, uh, Daphine Hellman stumbled onto PKI at Stanford. Sure. Kerberos came out of sure. MIT. So there's a lot of, I mean, and there's that natural progression from academia to startup, right? After uh, Daphine Hellman came up with that thing, remember they started uh, a company and they had four partners and all they did was sue each other for like two years or something. It was kind of crazy. but. Um, so I think that that natural sort of um, good ideas come out of universities and then it bleeds into small companies and then it finds our way, it finds its way to, uh, to um, uh, infrastructure. That's fine. That's a very natural sort of thing. I know here um, you guys have a, a culture of entrepreneurship and fostering that. I'd say keep doing it. You're absolutely right in, in terms of new ideas, new innovations, new products. But oftentimes we get too focused on the business solutions. In other words, we want our grad students and PhD students to invent the next Facebook or invent the next Google or something that can bring a real good return back to the university, perhaps in licensing. And what we've missed is the fundamental research. You know, why, do, why does failure happen? What makes a network network? You know, is, if you want to really get into this, is, are Shannon's theories correct? You know, has somebody gone back and re-looked decades? Not, not like what you're saying, just the last 10 or 15 years, but how about the last 50 years? We've really only had one path through computer science that's gotten us to where we are. Are there other paths? Are there other ways that we can go? And that may be an even deeper challenge, is while we're innovating, while we're creating, while we're doing entrepreneurial work, who's doing the deep, basic research? that doesn't result in a product, that doesn't result in the next Facebook, but does advance the science of networking and the science of security and this, those basic building blocks that we seem to have stopped doing research in maybe 15, 20 years ago because now we're so focused on let's build applications, let's build companies, let's, let's build on this kind of gravel that we put together. We didn't build concrete. So. I, I agree. And it's going to point the, and, and I think NY Holly, NYU Holly is, is slightly different than a lot of organizations or institutions I've seen. One of the recommendations I would have for the academic uh, institutions is to be more deliverable oriented and, and not just academic oriented, not just research oriented. To take that, I think those are all important to do all that research and to, that, to come up with that guidance, that policy. Um, but also, so often when I see in the academic community is doing this great stuff and then it, it ends, it didn't get to a, a product, or the, it, they're, getting to, they're trying to get to that end state, that perfect state, where you know, half of what they got to was much better than anything we had already. So I, I'm a very deliverable-oriented individual. I would love to see that a little bit more sort of ingrained into the academic uh, world. Love your way. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> So, uh, so information <coughs> sharing is, is great, and uh, working together, the government and business working together is great. Uh, but one of the big elephants in the room is privacy, right? I mean, if Google already knows everything that I do, and now they tell the government as well, uh, I mean, where do we sort of, how do we protect these things? What mechanisms do we bring in? Is, is it a policy thing, or research is needed, or technical me me measures need to be created? What, what, what are your thoughts on that, if you can maybe oh, no, discuss these things? Um, when we look at, uh, I can only um, give you what, uh, what we need here in law enforcement. And as far as Google goes, or a, a, a partnership with academia, it's hard to find a solution if you don't know what the question is. Um, when we find questions, it has to do with the perpetration of a crime. How, did it, how was the bad guy able to exploit the vulnerability? And with that, we go back to academia, um, they'll help us sort through it because, again, ours is a very uh, structured approach. We're after um, a, a particular set of people that have uh, committed a theft more, more times than not. How did they perpetrate the theft? And we use old-fashioned investigative techniques. Um, uh, I think Marcus uh, mentioned something about low-hanging fruit. Today, in the cyber world, again, they're after the low-hanging fruit. What is easily exploitable? Where can we get uh, the PIN numbers? Where can we get the, uh, um, uh, the ability to compromise a server and uh, take an account? 
and uh, rather than have the, uh, the max spending limit held at $4,000, let's bring it up to a million. And once we pull out a million, let's bring it back up to a million and keep it going worldwide. And how do they do the command and control when they have cash out teams throughout the, the uh, entire world? And in real time, being able to know if their cash out crews are actually uh, saying that they stole only 60,000 when, nope, in real time, and we have the communications, no, you stole 80,000. You just make sure I get my VIG. So with that, um, how, did they, how did they come across the exploitation of the, of the uh, um, server or uh, company? And uh, going back to academia, how do we prevent it in the future? So it's almost a cause and effect thing as far as the law enforcement goes. Now, when you were saying uh, with Google and Google tools, um, you know, Google is a, ser is a, is a great uh, search engine. And then you have Facebook and you have other organizations that um, allow folks to communicate. And that's part of what Google does. Um, what we're finding these days, and again, I'm only speaking from a law, law enforcement perspective, what we find is that um, the social cues in this area that you mentioned in, in human interaction, we um, pay attention to uh, you know, body language, how something's said. Um, do you get to know a face? Well, when you're dealing on the internet, you lose those cues and trust um, and the sense of danger is lost. Well, that's also lost on the bad guys, and that, and that, that helps us a lot, or gals, um, is that uh, they will go on these search engines and they will not only tell who they are, where they are, what they've done, and how they've done it. And we're able to exploit the vulnerabilities the same way they are. Now, what we want to do is work with academia is when we do collect this data, how do we cover our, our footprints or our tracks? to make sure that we can identify as many people as possible in, in a particular fraud scheme. And um, as we become um, better at what we do, they become better at what they do. So it's a, a non-ending process, and I believe it's been going on in crime uh, for a very, very long time. It's just a new system of committing crime. Um, and our partnership with academia is very important. Um, again, ours is a, a very narrow focus. It's catching the bad guys but the tools and the innovation, we don't have time to sit around and th think about how best we can pull in funds um, and be an anonymous and work up an organization. And we'll go back to academia and they'll come up with the tools because it's the bad guys relying on academia, maybe in uh, overseas. Uh, they're using uh, software engineers, they're using engineers to write and develop their products. Well, to, the only way to counter that is to get an equal uh, skill set uh, to look at it from an outside perspective. And um, with that, uh, law enforcement uh, quite often works very effectively with academia. But we have to have a question. Um, and with that question, we also get the solution and it comes from academia. Uh, hopefully I answered your question. Privacy. Well, the privacy, as far as privacy goes, um, we have a very, very um, uh, structured set um, when we uh, issue a subpoena or a court order we also have to establish probable cause. And with that, um, the government regulations, as far as privacy goes, are, are very stringent. And we have to go to a court, and with that court, we have to prove um, that it's a reasonable man standard that a crime has been committed. So with privacy, um, it comes the, uh, the, I guess the government, Department of Justice mandates it from at least the law enforcement perspective, um, that uh, we have to have certain criteria before we can violate someone's privacy. And once the data is, is, is brought in, we have to ensure that uh, it doesn't go any further. One of the things we've done in our forensics lab is cut it off from the internet. It's a, uh, a closed system. If we're bringing anything from the outside, we scrub it independently before we bring it into the lab. We want to make sure that the data we have, or the privacy that uh, we've um, infringed upon, um, remains a, a very unique uh, 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 data set. I don't know if we, we have can. about uh, 10 more minutes uh, for questions, and uh, unless uh, Nasser has a, another one. Uh, this comes from somewhere in cyberspace. Uh, with the recent news of private companies taking offensive measures uh, or active defenses, what do you think the positive and negative outcomes will be, and what is the likely long-term outcome of this type of behavior? for the corporate well, participants may want to say something about so you mean this. active defenses like hack you back? And, yes. Um, yeah. I don't think it's a great idea. <laughs> I mean, 
on, on multiple fronts. Like, first off, let's take intrusion detection as an example, and then we'll use, like, IDS to IPS is a good example of that. So IDSs don't really work too well because it's not always so clear what signatures you write, and you know, it's not always clear what you're blocking. So we decided the way to fix that was to make it an intrusion prevention system that in some sense is active and does something. So it's like giving a blind person a gun, right? Not a, not a real good uh, idea. Th this concept of, of hacking back keeps coming back every few years. I remember the uh, Air Force at one, one point was claiming that the solution is when somebody hacks you, hack them back. And um, I can't imagine any responsible organization, corporation, or government agency, you know, having as their policy that if they see inbound ingress activity, they're going to hack back. What would you do with a botnet, like hack your customers? I mean, it, so uh, it nev that, that never made sense to me. And, uh, you know, as it rewashes it and rehashes through, um, I, don't, I don't think it's reasonable. The physical world. Somebody comes up and takes a swing at me? Yeah. I'm going to swing back. No, I know. We're in Brooklyn, and, and so, so that's definitely true. Exactly. Right. Well, we un we understand that phenomenon. Got right? that. <laughs> and, and the Constitution, if you really want to kind of really get wacky, gives me several privileges. Yeah. As, you know, constitutionally, I can own a weapon. Constitutionally, I can defend my... I mean, there's yeah, certain no parameters. Are, how do you apply that to cyberspace? Yeah. You know, and do, and do you apply it, or do we need to even rethink some of those basic privileges and rights and stuff that we've, our society has adopted in the physical world? Do they map one for one to cyberspace, or do we need a different set of rules for how we interact in cyberspace? That's awkward, and that's why you get the growth of these organizations who will hack back for you for a price. They'll do the vigilante thing. They'll do because there's really no law preventing them from doing it. I mean, if somebody and drives up to your corporate headquarters and breaks the glass in your window. Do you have you guys run out there and go, where are you parked? <laughs> Break their windshield? Go there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe in Brooklyn you would, yeah. but I mean, you wouldn't do that. Uh, Think about where you are. Yeah. <laughs> it goes to your point. I mean, when the guy swings at you or the woman swings at you, you know who's doing it. In the offensive side of the house, you not necessarily know who it is that you're going to go back at. You know, there was a situation where somebody thought that they were getting attacked uh, when their principal was in another country. And they, they didn't know that, they, so they immediately cut off all access, and it was that the principal was showing off their website. And all of a sudden, the website was gone to them, well, so that was not good. Cutting things off, yeah. that's different. Yeah. What we call the secret cutting service. off, that's good. That's right, exactly. Let them go. Let them go. Let you guys go. Hack them down, right? <laughs> what we'd be happy Take it to Brooklyn. <laughs> we do need a job. No, um, as far as, uh, the, I think the, the word vigilanteism, it, it speaks in and of itself, whether it's the Old West or now, you, uh, you brought up a good point. How do you know that you're being vigilante towards the person that perpetrated the crime? Mm -hmm. And that's got to, you know, uh, if you're doing it to someone that had, that's innocent, uh, that's a crime in and of itself. So you've got to be uh, careful with it, uh, just from a moral uh, perspective. But if you do have the tools to hack back, uh, please bring it to us. We'd like to bring them to justice. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a, a great deterrent. Uh, we had um, just recently a hacker that was overseas. And we have to be very careful when we uh, arrest somebody. Um, when uh, they heard that uh, they were going to be brought back to the United States on charges for uh, network intrusions, 1030, 1029 violations, uh, they threw up in the airport. Uh, this is not a great place to be prosecuted uh, for violation of uh, uh, for network intrusions and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Over in uh, many countries, it's not against the law as long yeah. as you're hacking someone else's system. If you're in a country and you're not hacking their systems, you're good to go. Particularly if you're, if you're uh, uh, what we would call a blended actor. If you have ties to the government, you, everybody wants to make money, no matter what corporation you're in or what country you're in. No matter if you hold on to the old communist uh, uh, theories, you still want to line your pocket in case something goes bad. So these folks are uh, a way of generating money and, and, and power. So um, when uh, you know, they're, they're in their country, they feel protected. When they come over here, they're going to be prosecuted for violations of law and crimes committed against the United States. And they can do significant amounts of time, <coughs> 20, 30 years. Um, and they're not happy when that happens. So um, I would say arresting them, bringing them to justice, is a, a good way to get back at them in a, in, in a fair way, mm -hmm. measured way. It, you know, one, just so you get some sense of numbers, 
when things do get eventually to law enforcement, it's a big deal. Like just in the financial sector alone, I'll give you a, a stat here, since January through maybe May, just in denial of service, big denial of service attacks aimed at financial sector that we've seen, you guys probably see just as many, 40 of them. Big ones, like ones that cause a problem, not a single one involved law enforcement. So not only because you guys would say, yeah, this happens all day long. You know, I mean, the, when it gets to law enforcement, it's a biggie. So most of the time when these things are going on, the, the idea of retaliating doesn't even come up. Yeah, well, even, even at a local level, forensics, if, if my house gets broken into, I go to the sheriff, police department, they can come get fingerprints, they can do the criminal investigation. And we know how that works. If my organization gets broken into cyber-wise, Oftentimes, if I go to a local sheriff's department, police department, they don't have any way to do cyber forensics. So I now have to hire a third party to do that for me. So a whole industry now is, is developing yeah. in terms of cyber forensic analysis by non-law enforcement, non-governmental, private sector. How much of their information is now being shared with law enforcement? Or is that because there's now value in it, they keep it to themselves? So we're, we're entering into kind of an awkward position here where the government is unable to keep up with the, even the forensic side of it, so what emerges, going back to what I was talking about earlier, this chaotic world, a solution emerges that's private sector driven. But that solution doesn't follow the same rules as we would have had if, if a law enforcement yeah. agency were doing it. Yeah. And a lot of times those rules aren't well defined, so they're free to do as they wish until confined by, by some system. So we're going to have to come to grips with that as well, is how do they share with the traditional law enforcement partners, and in fact, can traditional law enforcement share with these emerging private investigators so that there's knowledge transfer back and forth so the private investigators can do what they're being paid to do? Dif different world, you know, different circumstances. And, and we have time for, uh, Just one last comment, by the way. I mean, the offensive uh, attack back by me feel good from a, you know, going after. That just assumes you even knew you got it uh, breached in the first place. I mean, so many of these attacks are so stealth that people don't even know they've been attacked. Exactly correct. So we did have a case. Uh, we did have a case where a, uh, a company uh, was hacked. Um, we uh, contacted the company and told them, um, yeah, we believe you were compromised. Your server was compromised. And this is the footprint that you want to look for. They came back to us, and, and this happens quite often. No, we're fine. Okay. So one of the account numbers, um, uh, we were able to get a, uh, we get a, a sample. We made a counterfeit card. We got approval from the United States Attorney's Office. And we were able to make a withdrawal against one of those, those numbers. Uh, we called them back and said, no, I think you should check again. And, and here's this number that we just compromised. Within an hour or two, they did come back and say, yes, we do have a problem. So identification of a problem is tough on the corporate side, even when law enforcement does contact them. At first, it is a denial more times than not. We have time for one uh, last question from the audience, and uh, I think this is a good one. Uh, it'll uh, test your mettle. Uh, what do you recommend to businesses that do not have an incident response plan for cyber intrusion? What partnerships so should they forge so that timely response can happen? Well, you should have a plan. Yeah. <laughs> so step one, get a plan, right? And then step two, you know, and maybe merged in with that as some partners. CIS can help. There's a lot of different groups that will help. But uh, you have to have a plan, right? I mean, whether you're a family, you know, having an emergency plan or a small business or big business, you play through the scenarios. Does that make sense? Uh, I mean, yeah, got, got to have one. Everybody, you have to embrace the concept that you will be intruded into, and in fact, you already have been intruded into. It's just, you know, to your point, when do you accept that as a reality and start dealing with it? And like any other planning, um, most of us have some kind of plan for a flood, a fire, you know, wind, peril, things that we would face in the natural world. We've already kind of thought this through, but we're not trained even as individuals to think through how do I react to a cyber type emergency even at the level of if I lose my identity and I find that credit cards are stolen or my bank account's been hacked or whatever, what do I do about that? You know, who do I call? Where, where's the first place I go? And even as individuals, we might struggle with that. 
much less businesses. And it, it's easy for you know, big companies like yours and mine. We've got you know, lots of resources we can plan ahead. But what if I'm a doctor's office? Or a, or a land surveying company or a real estate agent? Or, you know, is that something they even need to think about? Of course, the answer is yes. But then when they call their local sheriff's department, county police department, you know, hey, I'm trying to plan out what do I do in case I'm hit by cyber, the answer oftentimes is call the feds. <laughs> call, and, and then you guys are overwhelmed with, you know, what do you do at the, for very small organizations? So maybe ECTF um, or, or InfraGuard, you know, those kind of things are the places to go. Absolutely. Um, the ECTF, uh, there are uh, 31 um, ECTFs uh, set up throughout the world. We have two overseas, 29 domestically, and uh, we've never turned anybody away. Um, if there is a problem, especially with mom and pop organizations, you know, they're out there to sell pizzas or they're out there to sell wine. They bought a security system. The security system has been, co uh, correction, a processing system for credit cards and account numbers has been compromised. Um, they reached back to the company that sold it to them and they said, well, no, that's not our business. We, we sold it to you. No, it's your problem. Um, the only thing I can put out there is that DHS, Secret Service, uh, will be happy to uh, give whatever advice and guidance uh, to anybody, that, any organization that is compromised, no matter how small the, uh, how small the uh, business is. Usually, more times than not, there's more to it. So where there's one breach, there's another and another and another, and then we start tying it together. Just from my perspective, I agree with the plan, but make sure that the plan is not just your plan for your company. Uh, you need to make sure that whoever you do deal with, the third-party vendors that you deal with, have a plan as well. And then also your home. I mean, you're so interconnected from home um, to the office that you can't say, well, my office is now protected, but I'm at home. I don't need to worry about it because it is going to get into your office uh, through your home uh, network. So uh, those three are absolutely essential. Hello, folks. Uh, a terrific morning. Uh, a terrific lecture and now a even more interesting and uh, effective panel. So let's have a round of applause. <laughs> Good job, <right? laughs> uh, I want to also thank again uh, Paul Alsuski and the Sloan Foundation for the support of this and uh, the subsequent, there will be three others uh, which were, you're all invited and we would love to have uh, other members of uh, the organizations that you represent come and participate here or on the internet uh, to uh, participate in the live or on the webcast that we have now. Uh, I'd also like especially to thank Nasser and his faculty and staff uh, for uh, dreaming up this uh, fantastic uh, morning and uh, for inviting such uh, prominent and uh, effective speakers. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, my own staff, uh, Jay Vanderwerken, Lisa Boantuano, John uh, Vivolo, who sits here, Strat, who sits there, uh, our consultant, Elaine Cacciarelli, who works closely with the Sloan Foundation and uh, with other organizations to help us, artists could do, uh, Michelle Kerr, uh, Kathleen Hamilton, and a very special appreciation to Marlene Leekang, who uh, even in her sixth month of pregnancy uh, has been uh, the driving force behind this. And without her, uh, we wouldn't be sitting here and listening to these uh, speakers and uh, these interesting uh, uh, thoughts. So uh, a round of applause to them and to their participation. Uh, I'd like to call your attention to the next uh, of these um, cybersecurity series. Uh, it will be held on Friday, September 7th. It's in your program uh, on the uh, inside front cover, inside back cover of the uh, program in your hands. Uh, Deborah Plunkett, Director of Information Assurance at the National, uh, National Security Agency, uh, will be the distinguished cybersecurity lecturer, and it'll be right here in this very auditorium and online. So uh, those who have uh, green uh, bands uh, that were given to you at the um, uh, registration desk.